Hello again, everyone. This is Steve Callis of the Powell Memorial Alumni Association. And we're here with our continuing efforts to interview all the Power Hall of Famers. And tonight, today, we have a very special guest, Coach Brendan Malone, uh, who is actually a three-time member of the Power Hall of Fame. He's in others, other Hall of Fames, like I know, for example, the CHSAA. But at Power, he came in individually. He came in as coach to the 72 team that won the city championship, the basketball team, and also the 1976 team. Um, so the coach has a lifelong career in coaching, a 30-year career in the NBA, uh, and it's just great to welcome Coach Malone. And Coach, we're going to start with the first question. Where'd you grow up? I know you're a Queens guy. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to elementary school? Tell us about your early life growing up in Queens. Yeah, I grew up in Astoria, Queens. Uh, my mother and father were Irish immigrants, and uh, they... Uh, made a great uh, pick when we uh, we moved from 34th Street to 45th Street. Uh, it was a, a new tenement, uh, a row of tenements, and it was right across the street from a playground and, uh, and PS10. And in PS10, there was an alleyway where we played a lot of ball, but, and we didn't have a uh, TV. We didn't have a car. I didn't have a bike. I, I was living in the streets and well, I was always in the park playing either softball, stickball, or over in the basketball course playing basketball, or on the streets playing roller hockey. And uh, I played roller hockey an awful lot. And when I was uh, about 13 years old, I played, uh, tried out for the Pee Wee Rangers in Madison Square Garden. And I was the first kid picked because I got on the ice first. And, <laughs> and I uh, was skating and skating, and I felt a... a a, a touch on my shoulder and it was Phil Watson, who was a ranger. And he asked me my name. I said, Brendan Malone. He says, how old are you? I says, I'm 13. And he says, go over there and sit down. And he, uh, he picked me. And I also played uh, the first Pee Wee Ranger game. Uh, they had us play in between uh, uh, periods uh, on the Rovers. On, they played on Sunday afternoons. And I scored the first goal. I can still remember it uh, to this day. It was a one-timer. I received the pass from the right. I, 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 uh, I don't know how to describe it. I, I shot the puck in the lower uh, left-hand corner of the net, and there I am, Brendan Malone, star. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my aspiration, by the way, Steve. When I was a kid, oh, and they, they, I was picked for the All-Star team to go up to Canada, and we played up in Nova Scotia. Wow. And my aspiration was to be an NHL player. And I played up until uh, I was about 60, up until my senior year at Rice, uh, at, when I played in the Metropolitan Amateur Ice Hockey League for the Sands Point Tigers. And while I was doing that, I was pl uh, playing basketball as well, uh, CYO for the Elks and the whole bit. And uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I, 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 in my senior year, I went out for basketball at Rice and I made the team but I rarely played. I, uh, I was learning the game. And then when I went to Iona College, I played, uh, didn't have a scholarship. I played uh, freshman basketball and I, I was uh, playing a lot. And, uh, but I was still learning how to play the game. And I uh, played for Artie Wilkins who uh, liked me. He, uh, he uh, had a lot of interest in me. As a matter of fact, in between classes, he had me come over to the gym and work with me on back to basket moves. He thought I was going to grow to be about six foot six, but I never, that never happened. But he, he was very patient. In my sophomore year, I went out for the varsity and made it. And uh, at one time, uh, I got, we had like 15 guys on the team. I was in the top 10, and I, 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 I was ahead of some of the guys who had scholarships. But in the, uh, my junior year, I was cut. I, uh, I, I received an injury playing uh, touch tackle in the park and uh, I, I cut up my knee and uh, Jim McDermott uh, cut me. Uh, but I kept on playing uh, intramurals. And then when I went into the army, I kept on playing and I kept on getting better. But the one thing that uh, I always look back at, I started grammar school in, in January. And I went to Rice and I entered in January. I was like a year uh, behind uh, maturation. And I always felt that had I been 
uh, like a year later, I would have had a more successful uh, career as basketball on the collegiate level. But as I, uh, on a, when I left the army and I kept on playing, where I played every Sunday, uh, uh, Precious Blood Parish in Astoria, they had a gym. I was from St. Joseph's Parish, but they didn't have a gym. And uh, I, we would play uh, for every parish in Queens, but in Brooklyn, as a matter of fact, we won the Queens Brooklyn Championship. And uh, as I was playing, Father Brady came up to me one day and he asked me if I would coach his junior team. And I said, sure, I gotta be glad to. And we, uh, and I really got involved in it. And we won the uh, championship, the Northwest Deanery Championship, two years in a row. We uh, we beat the uh, St. Rita's, who had been dominated. And that's what got me going in, in, into uh, coaching was the uh, Father Brady asking me to coach his CYO team. And from there, I... I uh, we went on uh, to uh, go to school, got to NYU to get my master's in physical ed education. I had a BA, uh, BA in history from my owner. And uh, wh while I was going to uh, NYU, I called up Brother McMullen, who taught me at uh, Iona if I could uh, uh, work at power as a physical education teacher. And he hired me to be the uh, chairman of the physical edu education department. And uh, that first year I coached baseball. Uh, Kevin Riley was the baseball coach, but he uh, he did it in a haphazard way. Uh, he, uh, so uh, when I got, I got the job as a baseball coach, I went into the uh, locker room to see what equipment we had. And we had a couple of broken bats with nails in them with tape on them. We had a Pan Am bag with one stirrup with the balls are all taped up. And I said, well, the, the power didn't have that much of an interest in baseball. So I went, uh, I got money from Brother Serignano and I went over to Astoria to r and Sporting Goods store. And I, I got uh, Nellie Fox and uh, Jackie Robinson model, model bats, thick handle bats. So it would, uh, bat control, but also the, the bats wouldn't break as, uh, as quickly. And uh, from that point on, the best baseball program started to uh, grow as, and, and you were a part of it, a yeah, vital part of it. But uh, I, the first uh, pitcher I had was Paul Bijou, a tall left-hander who was very good. But I, I, I got from your area, Julio Alonso, Mike Smith from Hell's Kitchen, Jim Buggy from out in Queens, Tommy Langan from Queens. I had a lot of good pitchers and I had good catchers as well. And uh, we, uh, we started to compete. Uh, we, uh, we beat St. Peter's uh, out in Staten Island to get to uh, the finals against uh, Mount St. Michael's. Uh, and we're, I can still remember the game. We had bases loaded and uh, Larry MacGyver got up who could really hit and he could hit with power. And he hit a shot out to center field. He just missed hitting a grand slam home run by a, a fraction of an inch off his bat and we lost that. But that's, I got into baseball that way. But in basketball, I was, I was very fortunate uh, that uh, I, I coached up power because we had a wealth of talent uh, uh, as far as basketball is concerned. Kids from Gator Heaven, Parish out in Queens, guys from uh, Brooklyn, uh, Manhattan. And uh, and my first year uh, coaching at the AJV team, we won the city championship beating Malloy. And we beat Brian Winters in the St. John's and Brian Winters went on uh, to uh, fame uh, in the NBA. As a matter of fact, I think he's in the Milwaukee Bucks uh, Hall of Fame, but we beat them. And uh, after two years uh, of uh, coaching, uh, JV team. I, uh, Jack Cunett, the uh, previous head coach, took a job down in, uh, in New Jersey and he, his travel would, would prevent him from uh, continuing coaching and Brother Siriano uh, uh, elected me to uh, be the coach. And my first year, it was a struggle. 
But the second year, we won a city championship, and then we won another one. Uh, matter of fact, the first championship where we beat La Salle, and, uh, and on our team was John Candelari, who went on to fame of, beat, of throwing a no-hitter against the Mets. So he was a very good baseball player as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, when he played baseball and he pitched against us, <laughs> I don't know if you remember Henry, Henry Casals. I do. <laughs> Henry Casals hit two home runs off of Clint Candelaria, and I still think those ball, those balls are, are still going somewhere. <laughs> and, and, uh, because it, I wonder, every I always wonder about Henry uh, when he uh, heard about John Candelaria. He said, "Oh, I, I should have been a major leaguer because I hit him easy." But uh, so, but we we beat the. Uh, uh, Candelaria at LaSalle, and then we later on beat uh, <clears throat> Tallentine uh, for the city championship, and they had a guy named Charlie Brown, and they were very well coached. And uh, after, after uh, we uh, beat uh, Tallentine that night, I got a call from Dick Stewart, who had just been the name, the head coach of Fordham. And I think it got me at the right time, and that he, uh, I had been, I think I was getting burnt out at power. And he asked me if I would be his assistant at Fordham. And uh, the next day I said, uh, meet me uh, at my office around six o'clock because I have baseball practice. Uh, and uh, when I got back to the office and he was there, we, uh, we talked about my role and all that. <clears throat> and it was a precipitous uh, decision. and. In retrospect, I <clears throat> should have taken a little bit more time thinking about it because <clears throat> my relationship with Dick Stewart didn't work out all that great uh, at, at, <clears throat> at uh, Fordham. But uh, I um, got a job with Yale the year after and had a great time with Yale coaching the freshman team and the assistant varsity coach. And from Yale, <clears throat> There was uh, Rick Patino was the assistant coach at uh, Syracuse, who I had a, a relationship with, and he he took the job at Boston University, and he called me up and said he was leaving, and he, he uh, recommended me to Jim Beheim at Syracuse. I went up there for an interview, and I I uh, coached at Syracuse with Beheim for about six years, All right? And from there, I I got the job as a uh, the head coach at uh, Rhode Island. I guess I spent two years at Rhode Island and there I interviewed with Yubi Brown in the airport at uh, in Providence and I spent uh, two years with Yubi. He told me and he, he, he applauds me for this, of taking a chance because I, he was straight up with me. And he coach, said, that's, that's with the New York Knicks, right? Yeah. Okay. He, he, uh, he told me he uh, was under the gun. The season was going to start on the road because there was a horse show in Madison Square Garden. And if he didn't get off to a good start, he was going to get fired. He told me that straight up. Wow. But when we went in to negotiate my contract, Scotty Sterling, the general manager, said, uh, we're going to give me a one-year contract. You be uh, four for me to get more money, and he fought for me to get an extra year. And because he fought for me to get the extra year, I, I was in the NBA for 30 years because he was fired. And uh, I, he, the job was taken over by Bob Hill. He was fired and at the end of the year, Patino came in. And then after that, uh, I left that and I interviewed with Chuck Daly with the Detroit Pistons. And I, I uh, caught lightning in the bottle because the first two years I was with the Detroit Pistons, we won championships. And that was a, a tremendous ride, uh, playing with guys who came to work every day, worked hard, worked together, and uh, they uh, practices were harder than the games we played. And from, uh, from the Detroit Pistons- uh, Well, Coach, if I could stop you there for one sec, you became a mini celebrity last year, I hope you know this, in the last dance with the Michael Jordan 10-part documentary. I just want to read the quote that you gave so everybody knows you've been given credit for the Jordan rules. Uh, I think you simplified it a bit, but I think it was a key to them winning those two back-to-back -back titles. 
And here's your quote from episode three of The Last Dance. On the wings, we are going to push him to the elbow and we're not going to let him drive to the baseline. Number two, when he's on top, we're going to influence him to his left. When he got the ball in the low post, we were going to trap him from the top. That's the Jordan rules. And it was that simple. And then when the guy asked you, well, what happened when Jordan went baseline, you said the following, quote, that's when Lambeer and Mahorn would go up and knock him to the ground, close quote. So I think that's, on the one hand, the summary of the Jordan rules, which were so important, but on the other hand, kind of your approach to the game, here's how we're going to do it, here's what we're going to do, and if it goes this way, we got plan B. But -hmm. tell us a little about that, because that must have been a pretty good experience. That was just on TV last year in 2020. I had a history with Michael. Uh, I coached him at Five Star. Uh, He was uh, was a high school coach coming out of Wilmington, North Carolina. And he uh, was better. Um, the first time I saw him, the way he moves, he f- is fluid motion going to the basket. And you know, sometimes when you see a great athlete, then you stand out. And he was like that. And one thing that he didn't have, and he, he always had that tremendous competitive spirit uh, when he played. And that's what make, differentiates him from a lot of the guys who's better. Uh, uh, my, uh, Michael Jordan or uh, LeBron James or Kobe Bryant and all that. But the one thing that ser- uh, separates Michael from his athletic uh, uh, <clears throat> ability is his <clears throat> tremendous competitive drive. And he, uh, and <clears throat> so we, uh, so when, when uh, we, we've always had a kind of a, a relationship with him. As a matter of fact, when I, uh, was coaching up in Toronto. Uh, we 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 finally beat him. As, well, that year, Michael Jordan's team <clears throat> they won seventy two games, and I was uh, coaching the first year up in Toronto as an expansion team. We beat them, and uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the eight game games that uh, the uh, lost. And I was kneeling down in front of my uh, bench, and uh, Michael was right there. And I said, Michael, do you ever, don't you ever miss? because he was nailing uh, every <laughs> shot. And he says, Brendan, you, you know better than that. And, uh, but he finally did miss. He missed at the end of the game when we beat them. And uh, uh, it was like, when, we, and when I played a uh, coach up in Toronto, it was a novelty. People, I had to give a, 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 a clinic to all the press to go say, uh, and explaining the NBA rules because they didn't know them. And uh, Wow. They didn't go offside, nice in the puck and all that, but they didn't know anything about basketball. Wow. And uh, one time I was sitting in the stands before a game and Frank came up and says, I didn't realize how fast the game was. But uh, they, we, we, drew, we drew like almost 35,000 fans because of that dome. And uh, <clears throat> so after we beat them in that game, I was walking down the street to an Italian restaurant called La, La Grappa. And the people... Oh, they was dancing in the streets. Okay, we, this, I'm not uh, exaggerating. It was everybody was like uh, pumped up that we beat the uh, uh, Chicago Bulls. But uh, I'm going all over uh, and meandering about my career. But uh, Toronto, I was the first uh, coach of the Toronto Raptors. Uh, but uh, I uh, went from uh, UB to uh, uh, with uh, Chuck Daly and Chuck Daly, I went to Isaiah Thomas, naming me the uh, head coach of uh, the <clears throat> the Toronto Raptors, and then uh, I get lost after that. I, I, I went to uh, well after that, you went to the Knicks for four years after the Raptors. I've been I've been with the Knicks three different times. Yeah, I was with Yubi, I was with uh, Jeff Van Gundy, and then I was with Don Chaney. Yeah. And, uh, I, I always get a kick out of uh, when they introduced Patrick Ewan, who I work with uh, in the Orlando. Uh, and they would say, Patrick Ewan, once a Nick, always a Nick. And I say, uh, they never said, well, I was a Nick three different times and I never got that kind of an introduction. Uh, 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 but, uh, uh, speaking about Patrick, he just had knee surgery and, uh, and he had a blood clot, but uh, they gave him uh, multiple uh, blood thinners and he's doing all right right now. But uh, so a- after that, I uh, I went down to Orlando with uh, Stan Van Gundy. 
Well, coach, can we step back just a little? Because in the you went to the Knicks and then the Pacers back to the Knicks, but then you were with the Cavaliers. And for about, I think it was 20 games in 2005, you coached a very young, you were the interim head coach and you coached a very young LeBron James who was in his second year and had already become a star. I don't know if he was a superstar, but give us your thoughts on coaching LeBron in 2005 as the interim head coach. Yeah, he, uh, well, Paul Silas was fired and I, I was named the head coach. I got very uncomfortable being named the head coach and, uh, because the perception would be I try, I try to uh, get, you know, was working behind his back, which I didn't do. And uh, but to, when we when I was coaching uh, with Paul, the guy who was the most competitive player on our team was LeBron James. I mean, and uh, Paul was very smart that everything we did was competitive, competitive dr uh, drills because he wanted to win everything. The one thing that he, at that particular time, he uh, did not like to go in the post. He tried to get the ball into the low post. He, uh, he uh, kind of shied away from, since that time, he's become a very good low post player. But he, he started, uh, but the one thing that I, I, I will give him is that LeBron is a great coach. Now, people will ask me, who's a better player, LeBron James? or uh, Michael Jordan, and to me, the, the separation is like, uh, nobody is gonna match uh, Michael Jordan's competitiveness. competitiveness. I mean, right. he, Michael and uh, Kobe were two guys that wanted to take your heart, your soul, like both of them wanted to reach in behind your sternum and pull your heart out. That's how competitive those guys are. Mm -hmm. now, LeBron is a competitor, but I don't think he matches them. But LeBron is a great player. And, it's, and sometimes you, you, you would rather not compare, compare those great players. But as far as I'm concerned, it would be uh, Michael, would be LeBron. And, uh, and uh, no, it would, be, it would be Michael, Kobe, and LeBron. And then I was thinking about this recently. As a matter of fact, maybe a half hour ago. Nobody uh, ever mentions Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the Lou L. Sander Power Memorial. Yeah. He scored the most points uh, all time in the NBA. He has multiple t championships and everybody bypasses him. He should be on the Mount Rushmore. And then if you ask people who's going to be on the Mount Rushmore of the NBA, he's not, never mentioned. But, uh, and I would say, who's the, the greatest player who ever played? It would be uh, Kareem. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm meandering around here and, uh, and talking about great players that I coached, but I uh, didn't coach Kobe, but we coached, we played against him after, when I was in Orlando, we uh, won the uh, Eastern Conference Championship. We went out to LA and you could tell right away that the guy who was gonna dominate the series is gonna be Kobe. and he. he he dominated. He, he was a great player. So that, 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 I've been like, it all started my career in basketball is when Brother McMullen hired me, right, to, to, to uh, <clears throat> head up his physical ed education department. And when Brother Frank Serignano named me the uh, coach to replace Jack Hewnett, it was at power where it all started. And it was all started because I had the privilege of coaching kids from the boroughs of New York. There were hard nosed street kids from the city of New York who gave me the opportunity <clears throat> to uh, start my career in coaching that got me <clears throat> to where I am right now, a retired NBA coach after 30 years. Well, coach, the last, so the last two jobs you had with the Magic and then with the Pistons, we're all Stan Van Gundy, and I know also Jeff Van Gundy. So you had kind of a relationship, I guess, with the Van Gundy family. I think you told me once that they were like the hardest working guys that you knew. They had a tremendous work ethic. So talk about those final five seasons with Stan Van Gundy, and then two seasons with the Pistons. Uh, they were both Stan Van Gundy head coach teams. 
but I guess that's almost a lifelong maybe basketball camp thing that you started many years prior. Well, yeah, it's funny about Jeff Van Gundy. <clears throat> he was a, uh, he had a rush. His father started coaching out in California and then he got a job in, uh, up in uh, the Rochester area in New York. And I said, hey, he had to make a major tra change going from sunny California from the snowy winters of uh, Rochester. But he came down to Five Star and uh, there's a draft. You watch kids play and you, you pick your teams and all that. And uh, Brad Greenberg came up to me and said, if you need a point guard, I have a point guard that's in, that had the NBA, the NCAA and the NIT section. And he was in the NCAA section. He says, you could probably use him. So I, I, I it was, it was uh, Jeff Van Gundy. And uh, he, I used him as the good, good players played on the second and fourth quarters and the, uh, the backups who played the first and third. And we, <clears throat> Timmy O'Shea was one of the <clears throat> better point guards in the camp. And he uh, was playing the second and fourth quarter. As the week went on, Jeff Van Gundy was playing in the second fourth quarter because he was so, he could run a team. He was very smart. He uh, wasn't as athletically gifted as Timmy was, but you could always tell that he, he was a smart player. And he, uh, so when I got the job at uh, Rhode Island and I interviewed him because he was working uh, as an assistant at the, your records, uh, I, I didn't pick him. And it's it, it ironic that when I uh, got the job and when he got jobs, let's say with the, with the Knicks after uh, my, uh, uh, we were let go in, uh, in, in Detroit, he hired me, which was uh, interesting. And then when uh, I was out of a job, uh, I, I, I interviewed with Stan Van Gundy at Orlando and he, he, he picked me to be his assistant. And like you said, totally dedicated basketball people, very influenced by their father. And they're very bright, very hardworking. And uh, you, you can tell that Coach Stan, he, uh, he had a tough year this year uh, with uh, the New Orleans Pelicans. But you could tell, you could tell that he, uh, his, his handprint was on the team just by how organized they really were. But uh, every, anytime you went into a game, uh, if you were a coach, you had to be prepared for a Stan Van Gundy team. And uh, we, uh, Good man. Uh, you know, and he, they're both very giving, very giving people. Um, they're very empathetic to coaches who are out of a job. So, like when I, uh, when Don Cheney and I were uh, fired by the Knicks, the first day, the first night, I got a job from Stan Van Gundy. Wow. No, Jeff, Jeff, no, Jeff Van Gundy. And he invited me down. He was coaching Houston. So I flew down to Houston and it was, I was with him for over a week as he was in the playoffs. And uh, I was at all his practice and all that. Of course, they, they, they were guys who really cared about coaches. So coach, if I can ask you one other thing, I read an interesting article in The Athletic from a few years ago that talks about your relationship with Tobias Harris who at the time with the Pistons, you'll explain it better than I, was kind of an up and coming good player. And now he's a max contract guy with the 76ers who you know are the number one seed in the East. So tell us a little bit about that because I know he's a Long Island guy, you're, a, you're an Astoria guy and you kind of hit it off. But I found that article fascinating in terms of your relationship with Tobias Harris. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I, I got to know Tobias before I ever coached him. Uh, we, we just hit it off. Uh, talked about uh, uh, like in the Long Island about about uh, him being one of, you know there aren't that many great players coming out of Long Island he was one of them Jeff Rulin was another I think Julius Irvin was another <laughs> of course uh, but uh, he uh, he we always said hello we always like uh, exchange pleasantries and all that and then when we made the trade to get him uh, to uh, Detroit I, uh, he always would come to me and, and we would talk about what he would have to do. And that summer, I would drive out to uh, Long Island. And what Tobias would do, he had a uh, gym. It was a school. 
I forget what area it, Long Island it was, uh, but he um, he paid he paid to to use that gym every morning from about nine to about twelve. This is every day now during the summertime, and he uh, he worked on his game. And he uh, had a workout guy, and he worked on his three-point shooting, on his good dribble moves, uh, all his, uh, his skills. And sometimes I would take part in it. And he, uh, but I would go out there, and I, I went out there because I respected his work ethic, and <clears throat> and also it was part of my job uh, to report back to Stan Van Gundy and how the progress report, but. He is going to sign a max contract because he truly dedicated to to getting better. He uh, and I respect it because he, he just said he he put in the work every day. He took off Saturdays and Sundays, but every day he would get in that gym nine o'clock. I'd be there before nine. He'd come through the door and he was ready to work, and he would work uh, for almost two hours working on. His three-point shot. He had to make. Uh, he took uh, three hundred three-point shots after every practice, wow. and he uh, <clears throat> worked on his uh, dribble moves, uh, his back of the basket moves. I, I got him to dribble uh, and pass off the dribble, going left uh, to try and hit the weak side corner. And he uh, and I, I, I text him uh, up until recently. After every game, I, I watch him play, I, and I would text him my observations of his game. And if always, always I would finish it with stay aggressive because sometimes he would with Embiid and with Simmons and with uh, other players, he kind of took the backseat to it and said, he got to stay aggressive. And he, and you, you can see uh, with Embiid out, his shots have gone up where he's like scoring in the 30, 20s and 30s. And sometimes you'll see when Embiid is back, he's only taking about maybe 10 shots a game. But uh, very happy for uh, Tobias. Very low-key uh, young man. He uh, quiet, uh, and sometimes his game is quiet. And he has to learn <clears throat> to be aggressive all the time. So I'm curious to see how he does in the playoffs right now. So, Carlos, this has been fantastic. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about your lovely wife, Maureen, who has been through all of this, I guess, for, with you for, I don't know, almost 60 years, I'm guessing. And I know you're proud of all your children. The one that we know is, of course, your son, Mike, who's the coach of the Denver Nuggets and has made them a force in the West, which is still, to me, tougher than the East, depending on what happens with the Nets, of course, if they can get it together. But tell me a little bit about your family, any concluding words, any thoughts on the NBA today, whatever you want to wrap it up with, this is your time. Yeah, Michael <clears throat> has done a magnificent job with the uh, Nuggets. Uh, last year, <clears throat> they were down 3-1 against uh, the uh, Utah, and they came back and won that uh, series, and then I forget the other series, but they were down 3-1 in that series and came back and won that. And that was a uh, tremendous uh, um, and that, that was a reflection of his coaching. And uh, he, uh, his, his hard work is uh, paying attention to the little things and getting these guys to believe that they can come back and win. And right now, he's on the, he's on the man. Murray went down uh, with a leg injury. He had yeah. Martin, Barton is out. Uh, and uh, uh, Monte Morris, is, uh, his backup point guard, was out. He just came back. And uh, P.J. Clack, uh, Doja, uh, a rookie, who was a rotation player, he was out. So, but they continued to win without those guys. And so, I, I'm proud of that. Now, they 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 they're going to play Portland, and Portland's a, a very good basketball team. And if he had uh, a full roster, I think they would be competitive. And I'm curious, they're playing tonight at 10 o'clock, and. I, I'm curious to see how they come out and play because they did play the last play game game of the season in Portland against Portland. And I, I was very disappointed in their effort. They, uh, they didn't, didn't, they didn't compete. And I'm, I'm curious to see how they compete tonight. But uh, I, I had Kara, Brendan, 
Kevin, uh, uh, Michael, and my youngest daughter is uh, Sh uh, Shannon. Uh, three of them live in Colorado. My son, uh, Kevin, is an orthopedic surgeon up in uh, Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Wow. And uh, my oldest daughter was uh, worked for IBM. Uh, she was uh, majored in my finance up in Syracuse. And uh, she's a... Uh, She's uh, she survived a lot of uh, cuts uh, with this IBM, and she's still working out there. And uh, and my uh, the youngest daughter, who has uh, graduated from the University of Denver, has decided to, she found her, finally found her passion because she was working as in a, a school, which my uh, the most of the language was Spanish. But she uh, she found out that she liked counseling, so she's going into uh, uh, trying to get a master's in counseling as well. But uh, they, they're all doing well, and uh, I'm proud of them. And uh, and the, the person who really should get all the accolades and raising them is Maureen, uh, because while I was coaching other people's kids, she was coaching our kids. <laughs> and uh, and uh, she, she's we've been married for forever. <laughs> And I met her on the streets of Surrey, and uh, we've been married. We have, we have, as, as everybody, we have had ups and downs, but we survived World War One, Two, and Three, and still love each other. <laughs> That's a fantastic way to wrap it up, Coach. This has been great. Uh, people are going to love seeing this. This is Steve Callis for the Powell Memorial Academy Alumni Association, finishing an interview with three-time Powell Memorial Hall of Famer. Brendan Malone. Thanks very much, Coach. Hey, Steve. And one thing, when I, I stood up on the stage when, when I was inducted into the Hall of Fame, there was a big banner, a Palm Memorial banner, and it struck me. I said, the reason why I'm up here was because of Power Memorial Academy. It all started at Power. Now, it maybe it started with Father Brady asking me to be his coach, but the opportunity to coach and to get some sort of uh, notoriety was at Power Memorial. And, and, and coaching young men like yourself, Steve, uh, you, you, you always were a delight to coach and uh, always were very like intelligent. Uh, you, and your father, I always enjoyed talking to your father about the game of baseball because he had a passion for it. But uh, you, uh, you, 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 and a lot of guys like you at Power made my experience at Power an enjoyable one. I greatly appreciate you saying that, Coach. This is Steve Callis. We'll see you the next time. <laughs>